Right, so I finally got some time to have another look at this x-ray machine. Um, if you remember from the last videos, we had what looked like um, the non-volatile memory uh, corrupt or factory reset, um, and then fi finally figured out how to get into the factory menu. So um, let's see if we can have a fiddle, fiddle around there and um, get this thing working properly. Um, current situation is that when we do a scan, Uh, the current situation is when we get a scan we basically get a blank screen. Um, there's two issues. One, I noticed um, that the x-ray power settings seem to be very low, so uh, we'll have a play with that um, in the menu and um, see what happens then. Just have a quick run through uh, these menu, menu functions, see what's in there. Now, plot diode array, that, that, that's an interesting, I'll go, I'll go back to that because that, that, that's uh, the really interesting one. Normalize, again, I'll, I'll talk about that when we go into the diode, diode array stuff. Um, system burn-in, that, that's just um, a few options that lets you run it continuously for sort of factory testing and so on. So EGNG menu, it's obviously the factory engineer menu. Um, there's a number of things we've got in here. Um, machine type, that just lets you set a string which is displayed on startups, that's probably just to tell you, yeah, assign different model numbers depending on which options are installed, that sort of thing. Um, set soft switches, now um, this is what I'm assuming is uh, configuration settings for the various boards. Because if you go through this, it, it um, prompts you for switch settings for the various boards, the like the HIP board, um, DTP board, etc. And again, this could be something that, that's not set up right. One thing I did notice um, on this shielding cover that I found, it's actually got a load of settings: so HIP, DTP, DSP, and these are obviously match up with the switch settings on screen and these are actually different to the ones in the factory shipping sheet that I found because uh, at least one of these boards isn't the original board from the manufacturer so there's maybe some different settings associated with that um, that new board. Well, there's a few other sort of factory servicey type things in here we've got system operation and x-ray operation times these are just the timers that run so you know how how long things have been uh, running when you do a service service phone number again that's just the phone number that's displayed on screen so that when it goes wrong people know who to call pm reminder frequency this is uh something where it can pop up a reminder on screen that a per some sort of preventative maintenance is due um, and again there's a reminder reset on there um tack pulse frequency that is to do with the there's an encoder on the re on the conveyor belt and that produces a certain number of pulses for a certain distance traveled on the conveyor um so it needs to know that to be able to get the horizontal scaling right so that just sets that up so that that's probably um, something that's set, maybe if they can change the conveyor belt or they change the conveyor drive mode or something there may all be different conveyor options on there so that's something that uh, may need setting on there. Right, system configuration, this is where it gets, gets quite interesting. Um, one thing uh, which I found quite interesting is this option for bad diode skipping and what that lets you do is set up criteria that says if the, um, the value from the sense diode is either a bit above or below a certain value to skip it. Now, I'm not quite sure why you know, you do this. You know, diodes are generally fairly reliable, though they are exposed to x-ray, so it may well be there's some damage mechanism that means that there's some tiny little probability that over time diodes can actually degrade. So I suspect it's it's for that, so that you you know if you get the equivalent of like a bad pixel on a TFT screen, you can just tell it to ignore that, so you still get a, a more useful picture rather than one with sort of uh, corrupt diodes in it. The X-ray the, the X-ray parameters is really what we want to be um, looking at. So, so if we set the go set X-ray uh, KV, it's actually turned the X-ray um, turn the X-ray on. You can see the red light coming on. And it's probably it's currently set to 447, which is uh, I think the actual minimum this thing can do. So um, we can edit that, and the value that was written on that cover was 145. So we'll just set that to 145, and it's now telling us the feedback value is 146. It's doing a measurement, and it's confirming that we've changed. But we're still at a very low current. It's still only 0.29 milliamps. So we'll set the milliamp setting, which according to this should be 0.9 milliamps. Okay, I'll right, we'll just have a quick look through the rest of this menu while we're here. And again, we've, we're now showing 145 kV, 0.9 milliamps, so we should actually have some different x-rays happening now. 
uh, set system password, that's one of the, um, the passwords that con controls access to cer certain functions. Um, these are all about the belt direction, so depending on how it's installed, you might want to feed bags in different ends and get different directions. So you've got belt direction, which way f it considers forward, because the, the panel's labelled forward and reverse. Uh, whether menu access is enabled. Um, normalization, I'll, I'll talk about that um, a bit later, but that's basically when it does the normalization. It's like a calibration function. You can set that either never or only when the, the belt gets reversed or on every bag, which uh, seems a bit extreme, but uh, anyway. Right, it's telling us we need to restart the system because I think we went into that, the soft switches menu, and it seems to like to want to restart whenever we go into there, so it's to restart. Right, let's do a quick scan now. We should hopefully have some uh, the x ray set to the right value. Alright, so this, this does look, although this looks a bit of a mess, we do actually have an image which we didn't get before, but we've also got a lot of just noise and junk, and we've got a load of lines that are completely out. This, this pop up screen is just this TFT monitor complaining about the resolution, by the way, it's not the x-ray machine. Um, so um, let's just, I'm going to go in and check those um, soft switch settings, because I suspect yeah, the, the sort of snow stuff, it looks like it's the right data, but it, maybe it's the wrong format, maybe it's perhaps an A to D resolution or something that, that's set up that, um, differently for, the, for this um, board. Actually, just while we're here, I'll just quickly have a look at those other menu, menu options that are in here, the system setup. The other thing in this menu is ATA SLA. Now I think this is to do with um, it being able to automatically detect certain characteristics to sort of show to um, highlight things that it thinks are suspicious. Um, so f for example ATA type toggle, that seems to toggle um, between saying sort of density only area. So I suspect it's doing some sort of image recognition to look at certain areas to decide whether they're suspicious um, and say so there's a blink so I think it can just flash areas it thinks are, 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 look strange and um, there's maybe some other alarm say so, uh, I'm not sure what alarm might maybe it just means it beeps or something actually it says alarm light so maybe it flashes a light at you um, if it thinks there's perhaps an external light light option um, so I'm not sure what SLA and ATR, but I know on uh, on the relay board there is actually a relay that's marked SLA control, so maybe that's some external alarm or some sort of external light or something. I'm not quite sure, maybe someone that knows about these uh, things could uh, let me know. Uh, there's a few other things in here. Um, date and time is pretty much what you'd expect. Set the time, display time, date, the formats, all of the usual sort of stuff associated with time and date. Nothing particularly interesting there. Um, diagnostics. There's a few tests that it can do, um, so test CAN bus, um, that runs through and it looks like it's detected three items on the CAN bus, sort of the two, probably the user interface and the um, two main boards, and there's a whole load of things here that aren't connected because they're, they're not, not installed. And a few other things, test SCSI data transfer, which will be for testing the image transfer between the two boards. So it's testing day transfer, it's just showing the image there. Transfer complete. Um, display error log. Doesn't say anything. Hasn't. Well, one thing I, I'm actually quite surprised at is how little error checking seems to be in this system. With almost anything unplugged, it will still work. It won't even give you a warning message. I think it's really surprising for a bit of kit like this. You know, you can have like the SCSI cable unplugged or one of the CAN cables unplugged. Um, there are quite a few other things just not connected and the thing will just start up and pretend everything is rosy when actually it isn't. I mean, you can even unplug the x-ray generator and it will just start up and pretend everything's normal, which I was really surprised at, you know. A, that it works at all, and B, that it doesn't even give you an error message, which is, um, seems a little bit strange. Um, show colour curve. This is just showing a grayscale gray pattern. It's showing a, it shows a pattern on the, um, the colour monitor as well. X-ray ramp up. Now this is an interesting one. Um, when you turn this on, what happens is when you power the thing up, it's, it slowly it turns the X-ray on and slowly increases the power over a period of multiple minutes. Now um, I had quite a lot of look hunting around on the um, on the net about why you'd want to do this. I, I found a few user manuals for some other bits of, bits of X-ray kit, 
and it seems that it prolongs the life of the tube. If you, if, particularly if it's not been turned on for a long time, if you ramp it up very slowly, apparently it helps improve the lifetime. Now, there's a couple of the, the process I've seen a couple of um, things describing as seasoning the tube. Now, there's a couple of different explanations I've seen. One is that the sudden heating of the uh, the target after it's been not used for a while can cause cracking. But the other, which, which I think to me sounds a bit more plausible, is that over time uh, the electrodes and other materials in the tube can emit very small amounts of gas into the vacuum, obviously the tube's at a high vacuum. And if you turn the thing full on at 147 kV, that can, there's a risk of arcing because of these small amounts of gas residue. Whereas if you run the tube up slowly, uh, the heat and maybe there's a getter in there you know, reabsorbs this gas and prevents any arcing or other damage but yeah you know, I'm not totally sure I've, I've yet to see a convincing you know, definitive reason because it, it, interestingly it, so it mentions periods of the orders of days to months of inactivity um, after which it's a good idea to, to do this ramp up thing so my guess is it's to do with outgassing but I'm really not totally sure so I'd be quite interested to know if, if, you know, if anybody knows any more about that I'd be um, a little bit interested to, just to find out purely out of technical curiosity Right, so let's go into the EG Engine menu and just check out these uh, switch setting, these soft switch settings. Right, the first one is the same as the ones that are written down. The second one, um, there's one setting, this this zero. It shows zero on the factory shipping sheet, but on the the stuff that was written on that label, it shows a one there. So I'm guessing that might be a difference for this new. Um, DTP board. So let's change that to a one. And I think all these others are all the same. And it's going to want us to restart it. Let's try scan with these new switch settings and see what happens. Now that actually seems to be producing a more plausible image. We've got, we've not got that noise going on. We've got actually what looks like some fairly reasonable grayscale image there, but we've still got quite a lot of sort of corruption and general sort of not workingness. Let's take a look at this plot diode array function. Um, this looks like being a very useful um, diagnostic function. Basically, and what we can do is we can actually show the raw output from the um, sensor diodes. Now this is actually showing um, basically the whole array. We've got the, it's marked, it says sort of the, uh, I think that's the back box and that's the top box sensors. And it, show, it might be hard to see on screen, but it's showing black and white pixels, which, which we can actually show separately, um, which are the high energy and low energy um, sensors. And we can turn the x-ray on and off. So when we turn the x-ray on, we see we get signal all over the place, and when we turn it off, uh, it drops down to nothing. Now, this normalisation process, what it does when it first turns on, first, first thing it does is it runs the, the um, conveyor long enough to make sure there isn't anything in the beam. Um, it then takes a reading of all the sensor values and it then turns the x-ray on knowing that there's nothing in the beam and then takes a second measurement. So what it then does is it, because there's a lot of variation between the diodes, um, between the scintillator material on the diodes, and probably also the beam itself is probably not that, that uniform, it's taking two references. We're taking like a, effectively a dark value, and then an illuminated value, X-ray illuminated value, and it's then scaling those to, to be the, the full range to give us our, our, our grayscale. Um, so if I actually show plot normalized, that's now plotting the full range value. Um, one thing that's interesting here is actually still some quite big gaps. So it looks like we're stretching the A to D converter range, so we're only using a fairly small part of the um, the range on there might explain the noisiness. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. If we go back to raw, there's a, there's a few um, other options here we can zoom in on certain sections. If you want to look at certain diodes, um, so you can turn the x-ray on and off. I'm not quite sure what plot range is. Next, that's just, maybe that's purely taking the zero out, offset off, so it's not doing full normalisation, it's just taking the zero option off. That Yeah, I think that, that's what it's doing. The only difference that seems to be a bit of a vertical shift. And so we can show just the high energy and just the low energy detectors. Now what's interesting is we've got like fairly consistent signal there, then they seem to be going all over the place. But what is interesting, you know, 
one thing I thought I had was maybe these are some of these perhaps dodgy diodes that have deteriorated but if you actually look at the, um, the high energy and low energy there seems to be quite a correspondence it's probably a little bit hard to see but the the ones that are high on the high energy also seem to be the same on the low energy so and that suggests to me there's maybe something wrong with this we saw this sort of chain structure of the detector that starts at the bottom of the back box um, so yeah, all this data here looks fairly plausible in that you know we've got the X-ray sensitivity and we've got a fairly even line, but then it seems to go go a bit nuts, which I suspect is what a lot of this sort of odd screen garbage is. Although having said that, we've still not got a particularly great picture up at the top either. Um, but at least now we've got uh, you know, an instant diagnostic tool so that we can open up that box, we don't need the x-ray and we can just shine a light at it and we should be able to see what's going on. It gives us the opportunity to look like maybe try swapping boards, boards around, swapping diodes around, just to try and narrow down um, what's happening here. Right, I just went through those soft switch settings again. I noticed there was another setting on the DSP board that was wrong and now we've got something that looks much more like a sensible image. Uh, we seem, still seem to have a few odd um, glitches here, but most of it is actually a pretty decent image. That's a, um, a big chunky metal casting. Um, it's quite because it's heavy. It's heavy enough that it will go through the curtains without sticking. One problem is you stick something in a, a lightweight pl plastic bin through this thing. Those lead curtains are so heavy the thing just sticks. But this is just quite a handy little um, test target. So um, that's looking uh, quite reasonable. Go back and take a look at that photo diode array thing to see if that's changed at all. Right, so again, we, we've got this sort of fairly sensible line of pixels here. Turn the X-ray on again. It. Um, I don't know whether there's maybe some some correlation between the, this the, this sort of glitch here and the fact that this is where it suddenly starts going a bit going a bit funky. I don't quite know what's going on there, but. Um, at least now it's this is probably the time to sort of rip the back off and start swapping those boards around just to see if um, th this is some physical fault on the backboard or whether maybe there might still be some weird settings that perhaps some sort of timing or something because it clearly this as well as that um, data coax uh, signal there was some there's a ribbon cable which is probably some sort of addressing so it may there may be some issues there that it's actually sending the the um, information wrong so I, I don't remember getting these lines when I had the th thing working properly I don't recall actually seeing these lines although I mean I suppose it, it's conceivable that these are sort of the bad diode things but there, there does seem to be a, a pretty direct correlation um, actually oh, maybe I mean there's a sort of vague correlation between the sort of the high ones in the low energy and the high energy but it, it doesn't seem to be completely one-to-one -one. But they, you know, they are a little bit different, um, but they do, s I'm just wondering if it's really a bit hard to actually figure out. And actually, if we look through this carefully, we've got, we've got a high value here, and there's a high value at the top of the screen, or sort of glitch at the top of the screen. It ends okay for a while, and then we're sort of getting a few more. But there's certainly a lot more glitches here than we're seeing on the actual image. So I'm not really sure how well that, that corresponds. One thing you can see quite clearly, uh, if I turn the x-ray on, uh, I'm just going to sort of wave a metal pipe uh, across the sensors. And you can see if I start at the bottom of the back, we can see that that's where the pipe is on the bottom sensors. I move up the back and then along the top, you can, you can see that although the sensors are high, they are still detecting, but they just seem to maybe have a very high dark current or again, or some some issue with the, um, the whole data acquisition process. Right, I've just pulled the back off, um, put it back into this plot mode. Now it's interesting when it went into this mode, we've now got these great big spikes. Now I think these correspond to where the light is going through these slots and hitting the photo dies, producing a very high reading. So I'm wondering if these lines are indicating ones that are beyond the like the bad diode threshold. So if I move the light around, you can see the. Um, all the back box detectors picking, um, picking the signal up. Um, so I'm just wondering if those peaks are actually indicating the things that are outside of its nominal um, bad diode threshold when it starts up. So I'll just have a quick play with that threshold and see if that makes any difference. Right, it's a little bit hard to um, 
get get rid of all the light signals without working in total darkness. What I'm going to do, um, I'm going to take a look at this one little signal here that's higher than all the others. I'm going to try swapping the two diode arrays from th this bottom one to the one above it and just to see if that spot moves or stays in the same place and that'll tell us whether it's associated with um, an individual diode, diode or uh, something else. Right, now you see I'm covering up the array and we've still got that that peak in the same place which suggests it's not the actual diode, it may be the uh, board. I'll try swapping the boards, see if that makes a difference. Right, looking at these boards in the top box, 10 seems to have a lot of spikes but 11 hardly any, so I'm just going to try swapping those two boards out and see what happens. Um, I think I'll try swapping the diodes first and then swapping the boards. Right, I'll just swap the diodes and they seem to be pretty much the same, so let's try swapping the boards over, see what happens. Well, I've swapped the boards and 10 still seems to be a bit noisier than 11, but 11 seems to be a lot spikier than it was. I'm not sure, and I did do it with power on, so maybe something's um, confused it. So let's try power cycling and see if that makes any difference. Well, that's interesting. I've just power cycled it and they're all now showing a nice flat level, so I wonder if maybe there's just a bad connection. I, I, judging by the way this behaves, I'm fairly sure that this is it's reading something on startup that's then being stored and then used to um, control the you know, the data, whether it's some sort of additional calibration above the normalization or whether it's the normalization data. I'm not sure. Um, we've got this sort of still got this marker here, but we've got a very very level set of data now. So. Um, I just wonder if maybe all that rubbish was that it was there's maybe a bad connection on that um, analog cable and just me disturbing it has perhaps fixed that. So uh, I'll just slide the box back in and um, see what happens. Right, so I'll just turn the X-rays on and we seem to get yeah we have still got variation but it's much much smoother, much less variation than we had before. So um, we've still got this sort of vertical stripe here. Not quite sure what's going on with that. Um, this stripe does seem to be associated with the state of the detector. For example, when I powered it up with the um, with the box open and light on it, I, I got loads and loads of stripes. So maybe it's it's either out of range, you know, showing that the data that it read was out of range, or uh, some sort of overflow error or something. All right, let's try doing a scan. Right, well we seem to have got clean data, but we also seem to not actually have anything at all going on past a certain point in the detector array. Try and give it another restart. Yeah, we do still seem to have a fairly sensible looking set of data there. We've got a few different different markers. I'll do another scan. I've got a suspicion that actually if I don't turn it off for long enough some of these boards retain a little bit of data, they don't reset properly. Which I've had a few things that have you know done something weird, then I've just after I power cycled it briefly, but then power cycled it for longer and it sort of seems to have recovered, so let's just try another scan. Well we've got a few minor glitches but it does seem to be basically okay and Frankly, I don't think I can really be bothered to look any further into this. It's working well enough to have a play with before it gets totally taken apart, I think. You know, after restarting, we still seem to have got these some of these lines here. And again, these lines do correspond to diodes that have sort of high readings. So I suspect maybe you know these are the ones it found when it started up as having sort of unusual readings. It's interesting because I mean, that line was flat before, so I wonder if maybe there's perhaps even a RAM issue. It's it's not so much the diode that's not right, but it's the um, calibration data or something that it got when it normal. Let's try and normalise it. 
No, do your normal cycle, doesn't seem to make any difference at all. No, it's looking fairly similar. And it's better than it was before. I wonder if maybe there's still perhaps a slightly dodgy connection in there that's putting a bit of noise, but it's I think this is working well enough to play with, so I'm not really gonna spend any more any more time with it, I think. Actually start x-raying a few things.